Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of my podcast. My name is Isam Hijazi and I'm going to be your host. You are currently watching this live on YouTube, LinkedIn and Twitter. Today's topic will be the evolution of data architecture. As you may already know, data warehousing as a practice became very prominent during the late 1980s, especially after Ralph Kimball introduced the dimensional modeling architecture that we still use today. A couple of decades later, we stumbled upon some new challenges, seeing data growing in high volume, high velocity, and new variety. And that gave birth to what we know today as big data and the data lake architecture, which was coined by James Dixon back in 2010. Now, the promise of that was to deal with the complexity and the limitation that traditional data warehousing had. Yet, Another decade later, data experts came up with a new architecture called Data Mesh, and that was coined by Jamak Diani back in 2019. And that architecture basically is centered around creating data domains as products. To discuss and probably debate this topic, I'm glad to be joined today by an old friend and colleague of mine, Mr. Jeffrey Pollack. Jeff is an expert technology leader for data platforms, big data, data integration, and governance. He has been a CTO at successful startups and a senior executive at Fortune 100 tech vendors. Currently, he is the vice president of product and cloud services for data replication and streaming data at Oracle Corporation. Knowing Jeff for a while now, he's one of the most smartest people and visionary leaders that I worked with. He's been working or engineering artificial intelligence based data platforms since 2001. And he has also authored a couple of books like Semantic Web for Dummies and Adaptive Information. And from seeing and believing, he is a phenomenal and amazing public and keynote speaker. Now, before we get started, I would like to ask you all to do simple things. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to my channel by clicking that button right there. And if you're watching this on LinkedIn, please follow me on LinkedIn or add me to your connection. Now, regardless where you are watching this, please like my video because that will help me reach out to more people and, you know, spread the message and education about the podcast that I'm doing. And also, since this is a live podcast, anything that you type in the chat or in the comments like I'm seeing now will be visible to myself and my guest. And that means we might be able to incorporate that into our discussion and answer any of your questions live. So don't hesitate. If you've got nothing to say, simply say hello and where you're from. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Jeff, good evening to you, sir. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to resist some internal, uh, uh, you know, urge to discuss politics now because I know it's it's pretty much intense at the moment in the U.S. with the polls counting and all that. And knowing that you are from uh, um, uh, NC, I think you're still not yet counting the votes. So I think it's a bit intense right there in your state, right? That's right. I mean, I've told uh, several people on our Zoom calls today, we just got to buckle up and wait at this point. There's no point debating it. We just got to wait and see what happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's 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 avoid politics. I want to you know avoid the urge to do, discuss that and jump into uh, the topic of our podcast today, Jeff. I'm going to start by a simple question. Jeff, what happened to the good old rock and roll data warehousing? Why everybody want to kick that kid from the block and want to replace it with something new, whether that's data lake or data mesh? Is data, is data warehousing going to survive in the next, I don't know, one year, five years, 10 years? Uh, that's a great question. I, you know, one of the jokes I like to make is that um, in the world of information technology, you know, we're more fashion conscious than even, you know, the fashion industry. So yeah, there's definitely an element of this somewhere. It really is, you know, from wave to wave. I think there's a desire from uh, all of our technologists just to kind of stay on the, the front edge of, of innovation that's happening. And I think, honestly speaking, that drives a lot of the, the, the momentum uh, for these periodic innovation waves that we we go through, but I think that the tech more technical answer to your question 
probably lies in, I think, two significant shifts that I've seen really in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years. Uh, first is when we saw this wave of um, supplementing the traditional relational data warehouse with non-relational data sources. Um, right. In many ways, this is what drove, I think, the acceptance of the big data architecture as an augmentation strategy for the data warehouses. We, we began to see uh, rising economies of value around data that was not being sourced from a relational engine. Um, the second big shift, I think, that's happened more recently and maybe in the past five to seven years is um, really the uh, the economics of operating large scale data warehouses have gotten to such a scale, but not just on the software side, but also on the infrastructure side, that we've really seen um, the you know our, all of our customers look to to shift more and more of those workloads to the cloud so that they get the economy of scale that comes with having a, a third party vendor manage them. So I think that would be my my technical answer to your question is these two big waves of there's there's more data we're working with now and our customers want a greater economy of scale when they build their analytics platforms. So what are the real challenges or bottlenecks that you know traditional data warehousing has? What are the key drivers that you know, let's say me as an organization would make me shift my current paradigm from, you know, traditional data warehousing, which I've been using for the past, let's say, 20 years or so, and now wanting to, to go into big data and, and you know, data lakes uh, paradigm. What, what, what are some of those key drivers, uh, would you say? Yeah, I, I, let me answer the first part in more of a general way, and then I'll, I'll uh, pivot to a, a personal pet peeve of mine that'll kind of lead into this data mesh discussion. But um, on a more general side of things, you know, we've we've always had um, the option for more of a streaming ingestion. We used to call it, you know, a trickle feed, uh, but more and more, what we're seeing from our, our customers and, and really kind of the the need to drive. Uh, more successful analytics is a, a lower latency refresh on the data. And that, that ties in also with the operational need to reduce the overhead associated with taking data uh, out of the source systems or the systems of truth. Um, and so we've, we've seen kind of the underlying physical architecture of data movement, you know, how the, the ones and zeros move through time and space kind of shift um, over, over the years. Um, we've, you know, we've also seen the data modeling approaches kind of evolve, but it's been, I would argue, more of an incremental approach where, you know, we've, we've seen, as you pointed out in your introduction, a real, um, I think one of uh, testament to its success is the, the Kimball and Inman models of, yeah. of doing data warehousing. And those have really persisted um, as the foundation for how we bring value to the enterprise. And so it's, it's difficult to talk, uh, it's difficult to critique those, Isam, without pointing out that these have been really the foundation of all modern successful analytics for the past 30 years. Um, and so it's, we, we don't want to dismiss that, uh, but we also want to acknowledge that, that things are changing. Um, and when it, that gets to my second point around this, this pet peeve that I've got is we've been doing data management architectures around what I call a hub and spoke architecture mm -hmm. uh, for, for 30 years at this point, not, not just in the sense of the operational data stores and the, the data marts and the data warehouses, but also in how we do data movement with the hub and spoke architecture of ETL tools, uh, for example. And so these fall in the, the category of what you've pointed out as uh, Jimak has been saying with, with um, uh, 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 ThoughtWorks is these are monolithic architectures. And what we have the opportunity to do now, I think, is shift gears and think about, you know, what would a modern data management architecture look like where it's more of a distributed decentralized model without being so heavily dependent on monolithic centralization. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I'm really excited about as we kind of look forward to the next 10 years. But isn't that what Hadoop is, is all about? And, you know, data lakes in general is about to have distributed platform where the processing somehow is centralized yes but then the data is distributed and allows you to to create some of the things that you've just mentioned here uh i would disagree with that and let me let me explain um so you know in the beginning with with hadoop like i mentioned in in in, in my opinion what i saw firsthand as we evolved that architecture um you know 
10 years ago, the, the, a lot of the initial drivers to bring Hadoop as, an, as a supplemental um, uh, aspect of the data warehouse was to support polyglot data. Um, and, and Hadoop really was, was great at that because a lot of the initial value proposition was around schema-less processing or you know, working with, with data without having schemas defined before. And so it gives a lot more flexibility as far as creating you know, ultimately what in, in the good old days we call data swamps because people would just dump their data there and there'd be very little governance, very little structure. Um, but as far as the centralization versus decentralization, um, Hadoop and big data in general is notori notoriously monolithic um, in nature. Like in the in, going back to the genesis of Hadoop with HDFS and 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 um, you know uh, and how HDFS worked with uh, uh, with with the rest of the Hadoop frameworks, you had tightly coupled storage with compute, and and in those days you couldn't even decouple them. That was really you know, drove a lot of these early kind of Hortonworks and Cloudera type deployments where you were, you know, adding nodes and you each node, you had to have compute and storage attached to it. And it caused, you know, all of this expense around infrastructure and you'd have teams of 30 people kind of maintaining these giant monoliths. And by definition, they're monoliths. They were the mainframes of, of, of big data, if you will. Um, over time that changed. So now we see data lakes evolving into the cloud. And, you know, I would point to um, Azure Data Lake Gen 2 as you know, with what Databricks has done as kind of an interesting example of that. The first big innovation is you've separated compute and storage um, and you've begun to simplify the compute framework so that you're not dependent on 170 different Hadoop frameworks. You know, you can kind of narrow that down to, um, you know, Spark and the family, the ecosystem around Spark. Uh, but you're still dealing with what's inherently a centralized architecture. That just because um, maybe what you you might be referring to is Hadoop and Spark both provide massively parallel processing. Yeah. Uh, but the massively parallel processing of that is a is still a closed context. In that sense, your your data um, has to be uh, located near the compute nodes, and when you're doing the processing, you're pulling the data. Um, in, into memory uh, to, to work with it. And so still by definition, it's a, it's a centralized model. And you know, even from a, a PowerPoint architecture level, when you go talk to vendors that kind of advocate this kind of data lake, data lake house, you know, delta lake kind of approach, the first thing they start with talking about is, well, go ahead and bring all your data into object storage. You know, just here, here's your staging area. You have your bronze zone or your staging zone. Uh, bring it all into there, and 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 really, you know, that's no different than a, a very traditional hub and spoke architecture. We we used to do that, you know, 20 years ago in in Teradata. Um, it just now you're happen to, to do it on a public cloud vendor. What's wrong with that? I mean, isn't that something that will allow us to create data democratization and allow you know people to jump in and and do their own analytics or self service analytics, like people call it? What's what's wrong with that? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple things. I, I, I think what I'd first start by saying is um, these solutions work uh, and, and there's value in, in that. So the, in that sense, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, you can, in, in, and today, you know, many of our employers and many of our customers uh, have successful enterprise analytic solutions that run in these hub and spoke architectures or that run in these cloud Data lake architectures. Um, so, so in that sense, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, the 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 trigger point for evolution towards a more decentralized approach um, is is really being driven by DevOps and and data ops needs. And what I would point to as a metaphor here, uh, Isam, is sort of this pivot that ha began to happen ten years ago in the application development space as they shifted away from monolithic and client server type architectures for building applications and moving more towards what we call microservices and service mesh based architectures, the trigger for that shift in app dev or application development was to move towards a more agile way of doing continuous integration, continuous delivery in DevOps. And in the, the world of data and data management, um, it's that that same analogy there where, y yes, of course, you can make a monolith work and you can take a monolith to the cloud 
and the monolith will run successfully in the cloud, but it's still a monolith. And that means that it is managed from a development and operation standpoint as a monolith. And what, you know, what I'm seeing in the, the customer base that I work with right now is that our future, I believe, as an, as an industry and our, our customers across many industries, is inherently going to be multi-cloud. And when I say multi-cloud, that means uh, you're going to be running um, multiple public cloud vendors. It's not just going to be Amazon. It's not just going to be Azure or Oracle. It's going to be some mix of all of those. And, and you're also going to continue to have um, data assets and data products that run on premise. And so this idea that you can kind of have a singular data lake that kind of resides up in one of your multiple clouds is not really very realistic. What's, what's going to happen for sure is that you're going to have these multiple zones and puddles where there's processing and workloads and support that happens for different kinds of business units um, in different areas. And so the, the data management infrastructure needs to evolve to what um, is going to be decentralized because of the needs of the business. Um, we're going to have to run in a decentralized model. That's, that's very intriguing and interesting point, which I will come to in, in, in a little bit. But I want to go a step back, Jeff, here and go back to the data lakes architecture world. I would like to ask yeah. you, I mean, from your experience from the field and, and what you see globally across your customers, why did many customers fail with their you know, Hadoop or, or data lakes projects? And, and the other question is, is, is data lakes something that everybody should be jumping into as the, you know an upgrade from the traditional data warehousing or or what's your thoughts on that yeah um I, I, to the first question I'll, I'll refer you back to what i mentioned in my opening remarks is that you know we're incredibly fashion driven as an industry uh, as to what's fashionable at a particular point in time and you know to be honest with you there's been a lot of good research um, by analysts in this area of why data lakes have failed. And, um, you know, I, uh, from what I've seen you know, going back even 10 years to the beginning of the Apache, you know, frameworks as mainstream adoption into the enterprise domain, you know, one of the things that's always been the Achilles heel of these large big data projects has been um, lack of uh, line of business support, line of business sponsorship and line of business requirements. Um, and so when when these projects wind up being, you know, kind of a, a science experiment for IT, you know, they're bound to fail. Um, they, they really need to have laser focus on delivering business value. And the team that's working on the data like needs to wake up every day and think about business value as, as a deliverable. Um, and those those will be the projects that, that tend to succeed. The, the other uh, more maybe technical side of the answer is that um, over the years, uh, the evolution of these big data frameworks has been gradually catching up to what we would consider to be enterprise strength um, capability. So in the beginning, these you know the the the, the innovations around uh, open source massively parallel processing. Um, th this was the first time in the history of computing that anybody could go download software and have it kind of you know open source software run across a cluster of machines and kind of yeah. do the workloads that, that we saw, but they did not have enterprise governance, right? So there was you know, the security controls weren't there. Um, the, the lineage and metadata management, the catalog infrastructure was incredibly weak. Um, the integration uh, techniques with legacy platforms wasn't there. So there was all this sort of like homespun, you know, bespoke work that had to go into a, a data lake. Uh, to kind of even tie it in with with an enterprise uh, business uh, uh, estate, that 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 those were bound to fail because uh, I've had a number of customers come to me along the way. That the comment that stuck out to me several years ago was, you know, we were talking about all these exciting big data architectures, and you know, we were putting stuff on the whiteboard and could do this and could do that, and you know, the the question comes up, well, who's doing this? And you're like, well, well, Twitter does this, and Facebook does that, and you know, Amazon does this, and the customer is just like, look, I'm not Facebook, you know, I don't have 200 engineers that can you know go in and modify the source code of such and such framework to to make this stuff work. So um, I think that the technical part of the answer to your question is like over over time, these open source big data frameworks 
just took a while to mature uh, to the level where they could be pulled into an enterprise framework and be successful with, I would say, average engineers, with, with people who are not superstars um, to, to make the, the, the stuff work. And, and that's the way, let's be honest, most IT organizations on a global basis are staffed you know, to the median average of, of IT. They don't have the same you know, kind of caliber of superstars of the people that are creating the open source frameworks uh, to begin with. So that's, I think, been the, the other big challenge. So would you agree, you know, by, by, by me saying that it's not really realistic to have every organization to move from traditional data warehousing to data lakes completely? It's going to be specific use cases, specific pockets at the business who needs maybe to do that. And the traditional data warehousing, when I say traditional data warehousing, I'm, I'm talking about Teradata, I'm talking about Oracle data warehousing and, and those sorts of, you know, uh, uh, solid, robust kind of uh, data warehouses that have been there for forever. Would you agree on that point or not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm glad you reminded me. That was the second part of your question I didn't answer. The, um, the um, I'm working on uh, part five of my data mesh uh, series right now. And, and actually a little bit of a personal note for you, Sam, and, your, and our viewers here on, on this um, uh, the, this podcast. The One of my personal, you know, kind of favorite hobbies on the side outside of, of software and enterprise uh, tech is actually... Uh, space travel and and kind of monitoring what's going on with you know rocketry and governments and how we're you know when we're going to go to mars and when we're going to go around the moon and all this stuff and um one of the charts that i built for this part five of the data mesh series gets after this question very directly does, does everybody need the most advanced rocket ship to go to mars um you know, in, in order to just travel to, you know, their destination? The answer, of course, is no. And, and so, you know, we, the, the, the traditional conventional data warehouse has a place and it will be here to stay uh, for the long haul. It's not going anywhere. You know, there's people, some people just need a bicycle. Other people, you know, need a, a, a sedan. Other people, maybe a Cessna. You know, some people are going to go to the moon and they're going to want you know, the Saturn V rockets to go to the moon. And then you have people like Elon Musk that not only do they want to go to the moon, they want to go to the to Mars, but they want to do it repeatedly uh, and they want to do it uh, inexpensively. And so the, each one of those kind of scale changes leads you to a different uh, technology outcome. So in the data warehousing world, a, a traditional, you know, Kimball Inman, you know, small data mart, data warehouse makes perfect sense if your sources are relational, and um, you've got a uh, kind of a small budget for traditional, you know, time tested proven tools, or you've got low tolerance for risk, you don't want to be on the bleeding edge. Um, and you're talking about, you know, a single project, a small project, departmental project, or, you know, single initiative. Um, and, you know, what's what's great about these kind of smaller use cases is it's cheaper than ever to provide these solutions in the cloud, whether that's through Oracle Autonomous Data Warehouse or any number of the other cloud-based uh, data warehousing solutions, you can kind of spin up a data mart and be successful with it um, faster than has ever been possible in the last 20 years. But then you've got these other use cases as you climb the ladder of complexity where you do have large um, multinational corporations that have uh, data management infrastructure that spans multiple data centers, multiple public cloud vendors, multiple uh, time zones and geographies. And there's you know, multiple uh, business units that have accumulated over the years through mergers and acquisitions. And when they look at rationalizing data architecture and they wanna uh, maximize the return on investment that they get from data, um, they're the ones that are looking at how do you make your data architecture scalable so that it's constantly producing value uh, to the enterprise. And I would argue these are going to be some of the winners in the economy over time because they're treating their data resources as products um, and they're treating those data products as things that bring value. Um, and, and when you begin to think of your data as a product, you worry about the repeatability of it. You worry about the governance of it. You worry about how easy it is to access. And that, that's when you're going to get into, I think, these kind of you know, higher order discussions about, you know, should I be in a data mesh? Should I be in a, a hub and spoke architecture? Should I be tied to a specific vendor? Should I centralize on a single cloud? And and those discussions, uh, you know, metaphorically, you know, they're they're not just going to the to the moon. Um, they're wanting to to go to the moon 
lots and lots of times and to do it inexpensively. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so the, the message I want to tell also our, our viewers and listeners here, don't feel rushed or urged to go in, into these new trends, data mesh or, or data lake. If you don't really have the actual needs, if you don't have the actual use cases, that requires you to do so. If you're currently doing your, your current data architecture using, you know, uh, traditional ETL tool, traditional data warehousing technologies, and, and you're getting the value that you need from that, it's good enough. Once you actually make a use case that requires from you to, to get to that point and utilizing these technologies, then that is where you need to, to maybe jump into those new trends. But, but the thing is, don't, uh, don't feel like you need to go there because everybody is doing that. It's not really an accessory to get there if you want to get value. You can simply get that from your current uh, uh, tools and, and architecture. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. But let me expand on that a little bit. I've been thinking about that a lot um, because the there is inherent value in in decentralizing for decentralizing sake. And let me see if I can articulate that. It's it's similar in a way. Uh, um, uh, if anybody here has ever gone through the thought experiment of should I use a microservices architecture for my application, or should I stay with a monolith? There, there's been a similar debate in the application development community for almost 10 years. And just like what you just said, Assam, there's there's reasons to stay on a monolith, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, and not everybody should jump to microservices just, just because they want to be fashionable. But in, in, you know, one of the reasons you go to microservices ultimately is for the the promise of a more agile uh, DevOps model where you can do continuous integration, continuous delivery, and so you know even if you're not operating at multinational global scale for your data management architecture, one of the things you you might look at it from a comparing a, a traditional or a conventional uh, you know data warehouse architecture to a data mesh architecture is, you know, evaluate the dimension of, of DevOps, of, of data ops, of uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So how uh, much latency is acceptable in responding to new business requirements, responding to new business needs, or being able to continually push out updates and changes to your data management infrastructure. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to, I guess the, 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 the net point there is it doesn't always have to be about scale. It's not just about, you know, are you a giant company with giant, you know, data problems, but it's also about, you know, speed. So you can be a, a small business, uh, but if you're, you're interested in, you know, and you, you prioritize as a business requirement, um, lots of tight iterations in, in your analytics, lots of tight iterations on the decision-making systems that you're building. Um, having something that biases more towards this kind of decentralized data mesh architecture could be a, a real benefit there. So just wanted to mention that as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, before we, we jump into the next uh, question, I would like to ask everybody to continue asking those questions. I see many of them coming through the, the chat and the comments, keep them coming. We'll come to this at the very end. Um, so the, the next real question and the exciting one here, uh, Jeff, for you, let's start with defining what data mesh is. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We've been talking about it so much already. Maybe there's some people listening that don't even know what we're talking about. Exactly. Um, yes. So the, you know, the first element we, we kind of did mention already, which is that um, it's a shift away from a monolithic centralized architecture towards um, a, a decentralized and distributed architecture. And so that part, I think we've, we've, we've covered already. Um, so I won't belabor that. You mentioned in your opening remarks, I think what the team from ThoughtWorks has done very well here is they've framed the mindset shift or the mental shift that happens when you're thinking about um, a data mesh architecture to be focused on the output or the outcomes of the, the data uh, infrastructure, which is uh, in, in a data mesh uh, context, we call these data products. And so these data products, you know, one of the central characteristics here is that it, it's really uh, needs to be close to the business as far as the, the value proposition that they bring. So rather than thinking of data as just a byproduct of the infrastructure, you have to think about data as the product. It's the purpose uh, of, of why this uh, data mesh infrastructure exists. And, and with that mindset shift in, in thinking, um, you bring 
a lot of the product management characteristics to data. You bring a lot of the governance characteristics to data. So that's right. uh, uh, the, the second. Uh, but normally, I talk about uh, product uh, data domains and, and data products as the number one characteristic, decentralization as the, the number two characteristic. And then one of the things that I've really emphasized a lot in, in uh, my talks on data mesh is, is point number three around shifting towards an event-driven architecture. And so part of this sort of legacy infrastructure that was associated very closely with the monoliths of the last 30 years, in, including big data um, and, and also big data in the cloud, is batch processing, um, where your, your data movement, uh, your data processing, the workloads on data, tend to happen on the, the triggers of the schedulers in the infrastructure rather than on um, the events of the data. And we like to say kind of in, in my organization, all data is born fast. You, you can't show me any, any data that, that hasn't been born in an instant. So all data is born fast. If we scaffold the infrastructure from uh, cradle to grave, so that it's wired in a way to deal with data events as the fundamental atomic unit of consumption, then we can now deliver an IT infrastructure that has incredibly lower latency. And, th and that reduced latency for processing is what drives the benefits on the DevOps side, as well as the agility for innovation on the, uh, the business consumption side. So those are the three characteristics I would give to a data mesh. Number one is you have data product orientation. Number two, you've shifted from monoliths to, to decentralized architecture. And number three, your, your starting point uh, for, for modeling uh, data flows is event driven. Um, and, and you only use batch processing when you must. Uh, otherwise, you, you start with everything being event driven. So when you put kind of these three characteristics together, you wind up modeling a different type of um, enterprise data architecture than you do if you're thinking about monoliths, you're thinking about um, infrastructure first rather than data first, or you're thinking about batch processing rather than events. Um, and so the, the more, I think, modern approach to what we've, you know, now talk about as data mesh is taken together, kind of really that that sea change uh, that we're we're looking for to move the industry to the next level. I, I love I love the sound of that. And but, but Jeff, all all I'm hearing is this is something that we're already doing one way or another. I mean, but we're giving them some fancy names now. Data product. I mean, we had data marts in a way. If you look at <laughs> data lakes, um, you know some some of the architectures that I've seen happening and the way customers dealing with data lakes in general, they creating zones in their data lakes and each zone is is basically a product that is specialized in specific area of the business and it has governance and all that and if we're talking about event streaming then we've been doing that with the kappa architecture for instance so all, all these you know terms and terminology somehow seems to be something we've already using but then data mesh came um, as a framework more than uh, just uh, more than architecture just uh, the way to think about things rather than a physical architecture is is my assumption correct here or is there more to data mesh so um one of the things i know you've done your homework and you've looked at some of the thoughtworks presentations around data mesh and, and actually one of the things that i love about the way that jimak introduces this concept is she talks about um the structure of social scientific change many it's a big word probably many of you know about you've heard about paradigm shifts yeah. Well, there's a there's a lot of work that's gone, and this is also variable. But we 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 think about how do paradigm shifts occur? It's not this thing that 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 everything kind of changes at once. It's it's a little bit also what Malcolm Gladwell talks about as tipping points, where there's there's these these innovations that happen bit by bit until you reach a tipping point, and and all of a sudden everything is different. Um, and so this idea of a tipping point or a paradigm change is exactly what you've just described. Yes, of course, we've had streaming architectures around for, for 30 years. Um, yes, of course, we've had decentralized software architectures available for you know, 15 to 20 years. It did really even in the mainstream in the last 10 years. Um, you know, we've, we've had um, a lot of these kind of self-service tools that allow non-technical analysts to kind of build um, you know, let's say data products, I'll use quotes here, uh, data products in, in, in a self-service environment. But what's happened is they've, they've all been kind of deployed independently of each other. You kind of have these self-service engines that are running on a hub and spoke. You have 
these decentralized architectures, but they're only working in app integration patterns or they're only working in event sourcing models for microservices. They're not really working in, in, in data lakes. Or you have um, the Kappa architecture, which is uh, effectively in 100% a monolith. Um, the, I don't know, for those that don't know this background, in the beginning, we talked about the Lambda architecture, where it was basically, you know, Hadoop for batch processing and Apache Storm for, for speed processing. And they required completely different physical infrastructure. And all your physical infrastructure had storage and compute that was tied to it. And you had different engineers that had to maintain it. And you had different other different engineers that had to write, write code for it because they were different languages to, to, to write the workloads. Um, this came together in Kappa, which is great. And you know, now we have tools like Flink or we have um, you know, capabilities with structured Spark streaming that can run in a Delta Lake architecture, but it's still a monolith. You know, you, you've got these, these, these uh, streaming and batch workloads that are just running in one way. I can write a, you know, some, some Scholar, some structured Spark SQL and, and run it over here in Databricks on Azure, but I can't take and uh, distribute that uh, across, you know, the, the WAN to run a portion of that workload in a completely different virtual cloud network. Um, in order to do that, I need these pipeline technologies. But the pipeline technologies historically have been batch ETL engines, um, all operating again on hub and spoke and with batch processing. Yeah. So yes, uh, so I think the individual pieces have been there in that sense. There's not like a, you know, a single light bulb that's gone off and like I can point and say, well, there's this one thing. It's really about using these different innovations that have happened over the course of the last 10 years it, together, where now you, you shift towards an event driven model. You have pipelines that can run in a decentralized architecture. You've now got um, the ability to distribute workloads from uh, one cloud to another cloud using software defined networking that, you know, we really didn't have that available to us or re re more recently, the service mesh architecture where you have these uh, sidecar proxy patterns with uh, controllers that can seamlessly scale up and scale down workloads and also distribute workloads across different container management frameworks. You know, these technologies actually, many of them just didn't exist more than five years ago and certainly nobody's kind of put them together in a way that kind of takes us to the next level. So in, in, a, in a big picture is some, what I think is happening here is you're seeing all of these innovations that have occurred in different parts of the enterprise software domain being uh, thought about and applied to a data management problem for analytics. Yeah. And in many cases, the innovations that have occurred were not originally designed to solve analytic workload processing. The, the, but what we're doing is we're bringing them here now, the, the, the distributed uh, architectures, the event-driven architectures, the, um, the, the CICD uh, DevOps frameworks for service mesh. You bring those and you apply them to an analytics domain. And that you know, is another area that I think is central to what we talk a lot about for data mesh is it's about unifying the operational workloads with the analytic workloads. And so when we see those two data domains tied together, we really start to you know, materialize the value of having a common infrastructure that joins up what's happening on the operational side with the analytics side. So, so this sounds to me like we already got the tools, we already got the technologies, you know, we got the know-how, but it's more of a mindset to, to uh, this paradigm shift rather than a, a physical technology exchange. Is, is, is that correct? I think that there will need to be physical technologies that enable this. Um, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, another kind of um, pet peeve area of mine is this, this idea of uh, data pipelines. And I, I know we're going to get to this in, in a little bit, sort of what, yeah. whether data pipelines are first class or, or second class and how that relates to data domains and what you want to model in the domain. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to materialize and make concrete these solutions. And these solutions are taking, you know, physical data from applications that are located you know, physically somewhere in a specific network, in a specific, you know, geography. And we have to move them with very high levels of efficiency and very low levels of latency into the analytic processing environments. You know, and there's lots more complexity there, but just 
in a very simple way, you have the, the, the source of truth for the data that creates the data, and then you have the analytic workloads that, that do the analysis on the data. And so there's, there's physical um, uh, things that have to happen here as well. And that's where the tools and the technologies would, would come in. So to put a, a finer point on it, I think this intersection of data replication technologies that are dealing with change data events in SQL and NoSQL systems. This is where we get the event when it's born, a commit statement in a database somewhere, a commit statement in a, no, in a NoSQL engine. We, we have a committed transaction um, that we wanna move to an analytics domain and, and, and update some data over there. So then we have this kind of event pipeline framework and this event pipeline framework, it's not just running on the old CDC technologies from 20 years ago. What, what you're going to be deploying that on is a modern service mesh architecture that's probably being deployed across Docker containers, um, you know, some type of, of service mesh, whether that's, you know, Kubernetes or Kong or something else. Um, it's going to be going through an MTLS framework that can traverse, you know, multiple virtual cloud networks in a seamless way. So, yes, you, I mean, you, it's not just a matter of a mindset and you know taking you know old you know kimball style technologies and and you know painting a nice whiteboard picture and calling it a mesh no you you really in order to get the tangible benefits of a devops improvement of being able to do continuous integration continuous delivery um, if you want the tangible benefits of being able to allow your business consumers of the data products to innovate more quickly, you do need a, a tooling upgrade. Um, and that's where, um, you know, what I would say, there's, there's I think, a handful of vendors that are, are really kind of thinking about this problem and bringing the solutions here. I would say the ecosystem, like a lot of innovations in tech, the ecosystem will start around uh, systems integrators and uh, the systems integrators will use tools and technologies at hand to bring a solution to a customer. So I expect to see SSIs, you know, kind of building on this as well. What you can't do um, today, even in, in my own uh, area at, at Oracle, you can't kind of go just buy a single product or a single SKU and say, oh, I've got a data mesh. Um, that, that's really not um, gotcha. where we're at in the, the maturity life cycle. Um, and, and, you know, but the pieces... And, and elements of this, absolutely. We're, we're building out a lot. I would argue, you know, the event-driven architectures, the uh, MTLS service mesh type deployments, um, the mm -hmm. continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, data ops, the streaming pipelines, streaming ETLs. You know, we've got a lot of those um, capabilities today. What you see uh, other vendors, you know, focusing on a, a lot more of will be in the uh, catalog space. I think that's an interesting area dealing with ontologies and taxonomy and kind of, um, you know, what what does it mean to model a, a data domain in a, in a distributed data mesh? Uh, I think that's an, an interesting um, uh, challenge as well. And, and there'll be tools that, that focus on that. Right, right. There is this intriguing question I have for you, Jeff. Um, when, when we think of data when, of data mesh and those uh, products that we data products that we've been talking about and data domains, doesn't mean that each data products will will have its own uh, set of tools, technologies, and expertise, or or they're going to be unified across the organization. Uh, in order, I would say this: in in order for a data mesh to be successful, it has to take into account the de the decentralized nature of the human political organization as well as the uh, IT organization so um the you know you, you won't have a single unified domain uh, across a large you know multinational business but what you should have in your in your infrastructure is the ability to successfully manage and govern um, multiple concurrent domains where you have, you know, data entities, data elements, data pipelines, data properties that are, are shared across domains. Um, and so you want a, a strongly governed infrastructure that can accommodate the fact that, that there's these different domains. Back when I was, um, you, you pointed out in the intro, I was, you know, CTO of a couple of startups um, a while back where we really focused on semantic technologies and 
using uh, inference engines and, and artificial intelligence technology with metadata. And you know, even back in, in those days, we, we used to talk about the semantics of the data, the meaning of the data is really only reconciled at the eyeball. And what that what that means is that there's there's we're not yet at a state of evolution with AI where there's a, a, a universal AI that that can tell me the meaning of the data properties that I move through my enterprise networks. I can I, I can tell you about the data. I can tell you about the metadata. I can even do regression analysis and I can uh, deliver um, uh, lots of uh, machine learning probabilities about the metadata, about the correlation of all different things about my data, how it sounds, um, you know, how it's written, uh, where it occurs. But that doesn't actually reconcile the meaning of the data. The, the meaning right. of the data ultimately is how it's used in some application or, you know, ultimately some human consumer, some device consumer. And, and so these, the semantics of how data is associated to a, a domain is something that ultimately, um, as far as state of the art, what you'll see is you, you'll typically see uh, AI and ML supplements for human data stewards uh, who mm -hmm. curate the data. So the, to date, the best we've got in the industry are human beings that understand and know what the data is used for and they curate it. Um, and so that's, you know, I think ultimately where we see kind of the the, the association to these da these data domains. And, and, and th this sounds to me like additional layer of complexity. I mean, from governance perspective, from operation perspective, from expertise, meaning if, if you want to have really distributed kind of architecture or environment or culture across the organization and creating those multi multi uh, products, then it means each each domain data domain will have their own people will have their own technology and, and that will add burden to the organization not having unified technology and this is something that i've seen customer trying to fight we go to customer they say no i just want to have unified tool i don't want, i don't want to have informatic and oracle and talent and and so on this is a struggle that they have but now we go and tell them about this data mesh wouldn't that imply to them that hey they will have the freedom to choose the set of technology that they want to work with yeah, in my opinion, um, um, multi-vendor ecosystem is is uh, is the the primary reality of most large um, multinational organizations, and I think it's pretty rare to find a customer that can successfully uh, standardize on a single vendor, especially in a data management uh, context. I um, I've been doing this for over 20 years in the data management space. One of the things that uh, honestly I did not see coming, I'm I'm still astounded by today is the diversity of uh, tools that are there right now in the data management space. Every year it's getting more complicated, not less. Um, and when I look at, you know, uh, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there were, you know, only a handful of options for graph databases, only a handful of options for, you know, NoSQL or key value stores. You know, now it's like, you know, everybody and their sister's cousin has got their own key value store. They got their own graph engine, you know, every database has a, a graph query profile. They're doing property graphs, and so, you know, the, and 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 you see that same diversity in the ecosystems of our customers. Um, it's not just about mixed vendors. I think it, it's also, you know, you've got um, all kinds of different data, data properties, and you know, even from the application side, um, what I think people really wanted to achieve with a lot of these cloud SaaS applications was simplicity, right? The promise of, you know, no more software to install. Um, and what's ended up happening is now a lot of these, you know, midsize and larger companies, they don't just have one SaaS application vendor. They've got, you know, five, 10, 15. Right. Um, and then they've got, you know, important data assets in all of these different SaaS applications. So I would argue some that the, the diversity of the environment that our customers live in is getting more complicated, uh, not less complicated. And um, I'll go back to what we said earlier, which is that, if you have a departmental problem and, and your departmental problem is really just pulling data from one or two apps and you've got a really kind of concrete reporting use case, mm -hmm. you know, use mm -hmm. the time tested proven ways of doing data warehousing. Yeah. You need to do a data mesh. Um, but if your if your use cases are to do data wrangling across an enterprise estate uh, to be able to um, institute a culture 
of uh, producing value from your data products, of using data for driving innovation in the business, uh, then I think you're going to need to shift uh, to this type of architecture. I'll, I'll use another space metaphor here, which is, um, you know, we we went to the moon in the 1960s with these, you know, the rocketry that we built at that time was on top of what we call a Saturn V rocket. And, and through just kind of the sheer, you know, manpower, uh, I should say person power to be politically correct, people power, and 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 innovation that kind of went in for for uh, ten years of, of of building, we were able to get people to the moon, and we were able to 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 walk on the moon and do these amazing things. But we haven't been back since, right? We haven't been back in forty years. And and the 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 thing is, is that the effort that it takes to solve these huge problems at grand scale are often so expensive and so cost prohibitive. That they're not repeatable, and so that's where we get to the value proposition of a data mesh. Is that if, if you have an, a large organization that you know wants to stay on a monolithic architecture, you know the you know multiple teradata's or data warehouses, and they want you know giant you know I remember back in the day people used to run Informatica on you know HP Superdomes and you know all these things, you know it is yeah. insane, right? So, but if you want to build this giant architecture with giant data lakes and giant ETL hubs and giant data warehouse. You can, absolutely, but it's gonna cost a ton. It's gonna be incredibly brittle. You're not gonna be repeatable. And then once you've built it, you're gonna probably find that it doesn't solve the mission that you intended to solve when you built it in the first place. So that's where I would argue we we rethink this data architecture so that you know, you're not trying to build the Saturn V rocket with $3 trillion uh, to, to go to the moon you know, one time or even five times. Um, what you want to do is, is in the case of, um, you know, Elon Musk. What I, one of his more famous quotes, I think, is, it, it's, it's not about just building the product. It's about focusing on making the factory that builds the product as a product. And so this is what he's done with Tesla, and this is what he's done with SpaceX is that he focuses on making the factories that are building the devices repeatable. And so if you notice what they're doing with SpaceX right now, they've got this huge pipeline or backlog of rockets where each rocket is a new iteration and they're constantly you know, iterating and they've got a, a pipeline that's you know, 12 or 15 rockets deep. And with, with Tesla, you know, they focused on making the factories repeatable so that they can go from Hawthorne to China to Germany, and the, the factories become the repeatable process. This is the same thing with the data mesh. You know, you don't want to put all of your resources into just building a monolith one time that solves you know some problem you know that was relevant five years ago. What you want to focus on is building a data architecture that has the flexibility where the data architecture itself is the product, um, yeah. and and then then you're able to really innovate and drive change because you don't know what your business requirements are going to be five years from now. Um, and, I think, so that, and, that, and I think this is where you might be disagreeing with, with Jamak saying that we should be treating data domains as a first class you know, aspect or concern and the data pipelines as, as a second um, class. Well, I, I certainly uh, uh, diverge in thinking. I believe that, that pipelines um, have to be a first class element of a successful data mesh because um, it's like I said before, the semantics of the data are where it meets the eye and what actually does the workload to make the data consumable as a product or to make the data useful in any software is the pipeline. And whether, you know, even in the old days with batch pipelines, we, we, we had ETL pipelines in the, in the new way we would be doing, you know, stream processing. Um, but you can't, you know, at the end of the day, you actually have tangible ones and zeros. Um, and that's the thing that I think that's lost on uh, many people that haven't been in the details of these. There's, there's actually a physical um, chain of, we call it impedance mismatch that happens with the data from the point and a record is inserted into the database to the, where it's available in the logging infrastructure of a database engine to how the change records are stored, you know, in, you know, on, on, uh, on the database engine to how it's, you know, moved across the wire as a, as a, as a, uh, what protocol it's in eventually to some payload where that payload 
might be JSON or Avro, or if you're running analytics, it might be to be an Orc or Parquet. It might need to go back to a relational data, uh, a database. So you've got all of these kind of physical things that need to happen to data. It's it's not we we can't wave our hands in the air and say there's this sort of entity of a customer that's out yeah. there. Well, that when we materialize a record of the customer, it's actually going to be probably in 15 different physical formats from the point it's created on a device to the point it's consumed in a data lake. And what is it that allows us to deal with that complexity? It's the pipelines. And so we don't do pipelines as a byproduct. We do pipelines as a necessity of, of managing the semantics of the data. And, and every step transformation that a pipeline does can change the metadata and change the data of, of, that, uh, of that entity. So in, in my opinion, the, the, data dom- the entities in the data domain are absolutely first class, uh, but the pipelines Great. are also first class because if, if you don't manage and govern the pipelines, if you don't have, if you don't treat the pipelines themselves as a product, yeah. um, you're going to fail with the repeatability and the, the DevOps uh, aspect of, of managing your infrastructure. You just can't treat it as a byproduct. That's what we've been doing for 30 years. And, and that's okay. what's gotten us to this point where it's it's such a, a spaghetti you know, mess of, of code that people have to deal with. And, and that's not sustainable at scale. I agree. You cannot, you cannot ignore the foundation here. Absolutely. I agree with that. Uh, look, Jeff, uh, this, this topic is really interesting, but we're running out of time. And before we, we end up this podcast, there's some comments and questions from, from people who are watching this. So let's jump into that. Great. All right. Uh, we've got rock and roll from Justin, rock and roll brother. And we've got <laughs> hello from hey, David. David. Hey, David, long time mate. And we've got hello from Sarah Sydney. Hello, Sarah. Hello from Singapore, from Fiona. Hello from Auckland, from Muhammad. And we've got hello from uh, Amwell, from Bogoto. And someone from the Northern Rivers, Australia, Thomas. Hello, Thomas. And Vinay from Singapore. Martin from Prague. Oh, it's too late for you, my friend. And we've got Ferdi from Indonesia. We've got Joel from Sydney from Karthik from Sydney as well. Mariam from New South Wales, Australia. Krista from Argentina. Wow, I've got people from all over the world. All I right, like the then. international representation. Yeah, absolutely. No one is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question from Jason here. He's saying Data Lake besides a data warehouse is a very simple scalable design that is often good enough. Could you please speak more about data mesh and where things are heading for the SMB space, small, uh, medium-sized businesses? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Let me see if I can summarize. I think we covered it in the first 20 minutes. What um, what I would say is, you know, we don't need to uh, leave behind the data warehouse. We don't need to leave behind this um, architecture of using a data lake besides a, a data warehouse. So I think when you have polyglot data formats, that you want to combine um, together in a in a data warehouse. Uh, that you know, having a data lake to supplement the data warehouse makes makes a lot of sense. Um, what um, and and also for SMBs, this can be the most efficient and economical uh, way to solve a, a specific analytics problem. So these are good solutions that should should stay there. Um, from an SMB space, the re- the reasons to look at a data mesh is if you uh, have a business requirement that prioritizes fast iteration, that prioritizes efficient DevOps, um, or that's dealing with a um, a multi cloud type of architecture. I think those would be some of the reasons to to really consider uh, data mesh inside a, a SMB context. Otherwise, you know, go with what's cheap and what works. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Another question from Thomas Otto. He's asking, uh, hi, Sam, can you ask traditional Inman, Kimball and Data Vault, uh, example, source structured, but small IP on business layer and hence maybe use DV instead of traditional ETL to not be locked into the modeling dead end? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a great, I, I almost brought up a uh, data vault modeling um, earlier. There's, I mean, this itself is probably a whole separate podcast. D- D- data vault used for a lot of different reasons. 
what, what I would say as um, one of the things that's built into this idea of a mesh, especially for um, relational data movement, we're assuming a replication, change data capture, event-driven type approach uh, for data movement. And what this um, allows us to do with the data mesh that is one of the attractive features of a data vault is that you get this um, very uh, fine-grained view of, of, um, of, of your data events, of your updates and inserts. So rather than just kind of dealing with these infrequent batch cycles where you're doing delta changes across you know, hours, um, you're, you're able to kind of see this uh, auditable record trail of the individual uh, actions that have happened on the data and, and you preserve those in a data vault model architecture would be kind of an insert only approach for the staging area. In, in a, in a uh, data mesh, you have this kind of running transaction log. It, it builds on what we've heard about over the years in the, in the Kafka community um, as a, an enterprise um, uh, uh, data log for, for our enterprise transaction log for enterprise transactions. And so within this idea of a, of a data mesh, you, you have these kind of uh, logging infrastructure that gives you an, an auditable uh, place to go back to, to see your, your data events. And that's you know one of the things that would be similar uh, between a, a, a data a vault uh, architecture and a, a data mesh. Uh, where I think things differ a little bit is only in Data Vault uh, model uh, version two that they began to really uh, deal more effectively with polyglot data sources. In a data mesh, again, you're building from the ground up, assuming event driven, and your payloads can be relational or non relational uh, payloads. So I, I think that this is where I would argue a, 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 a you know, modern data mesh architecture will be you know, much closer to um, a, a polyglot event-driven model than a, a data vault architecture would. Great, great, thanks, thanks, Jeff. Um, all right, we've got another question from Vinay. He's asking, um, how does the data governance look like in a decentralized data mesh architecture? We answered this briefly, but can you summarize the answer, Jeff, really quick? Yeah, I think in the, the short answer to this is that it, it, it has to be the same. I mean, from a from a business perspective, you know, you you want to be able to uh, audit. You want to be able to govern. You want to be able to have lineage and traceability. Understand the provenance of your data. Uh, when everything is decentralized, understanding provenance and lineage becomes more complicated. Like, look, if if uh, we'll go back to your example with um, with data lakes. If 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 somebody wants to just build a single data lake, put all their data in there, and then just manage everything through you know, Databricks, um, you know, great. That, that's like, that can in many ways kind of simplify the governance because it's it's yeah. all there in, in one location. The The challenge, of course, is that's not a practical solution for, for, for most large enterprises to kind of have one and one only. Um, but when you when you go the other direction on the other end of the scale and you assume everything's decentralized and, and all your pipelines are distributed and your workloads can run anywhere, you need a controller. And that's another point that I make. I, we didn't get a chance to talk too much about that, Isam, but um, it's another reason I think tools are incredibly important because if you, uh, same thing with a service mesh, um, you, you know, the, there is some standardization work happening around service mesh, but for the most part, it's all vendor specific at this point. Um, you know, Knative is different from Kong, is different from OpenShift, is different from whatever. And But where you get governance in a service mesh, is through a controller sidecar uh, architecture where you've got you know uh, basically a, a control plane that listens and observes what's happening in the data plane, and so with a data mesh type architecture, you really do need this kind of control plane framework, and it's a critical aspect of, of governance. So I would summarize it by saying the governance has to be there. That's kind of one of the core elements, but it's it's not any easier. In many ways, it's harder with a data mesh. Absolutely. All right, we've got hi from Juliana from Adelaide, and we've got a hi from yeah. George saying hi, Sam and Jeffrey. Hi, George. And we've got hi from Hansen from Malaysia. And we've got hi from Danny from Indonesia. And then we've got a question from Jason. He's asking that Mesh sounds more like a refinement of the collection and staging and maybe some integration layer. I like it. But how does this transfer to small and more, uh, medium spheres? I think we answered this previously. Yeah, uh, let me let me. Can I add to that just a little? So yeah, we, we did yeah. discuss it before. Um, the other thing that I think is really fascinating here is that when you expand, if um, 
if you think about what what does it mean to have a data mesh on a single cloud, I think is an interesting question. And this relates to an SMB use case. So if you have an SMB use case and they're kind of all in on a, on a single cloud vendor, you know, does it even make sense to think of a data mesh or are you inherently back in a, a, a data hub architecture? I, where, where I think the data mesh starts to get very interesting, even in a single cloud context, is the emergence and widespread usage of um, these serverless technologies, whether that's you know uh, Lambda functions or um, serverless uh, Spark computing uh, for serverless ETL workloads. Um, we're going to have a serverless data replication uh, framework soon in, in Oracle and on Golden Gate. Um, you've got kind of serverless, you know, ETL. You've got these sort of, you know, cl uh, catalog-based use cases that are, you know, basically pay per use. Um, and so, when you think about a mesh, one of the characteristics that I emphasized before is that you're event-driven. And what's a better representation of that than if you're running in a public cloud and the only time you instantiate physically instantiate the mesh is when the data events are flowing. If the data events are not flowing, there's nothing running. Um, and so I think that would be another way to look at this SMB example is, you know, building out a data management framework where everything is serverless. Um, and what that means kind of technically in my mind is that everything is event driven. Yeah. Yeah. Another question from Jason as well. And he's asking, is there a standardization to encourage repeatability intercompany? Yeah, um, I would point back to there's some real interesting work happening to standardize uh, microservices infrastructure, this control plane, data plane, or, uh, and that will come into play a lot for the mesh. It'll also come into play for security and routing. What, one of the key things I think for inter intercompany and standardization is um, uh, pipelines that can navigate multiple virtual cloud networks. And in order to do that, it's not enough to just have you know mutual TLS handshakes. What you need is you're going to need uh, the security and routing controls that are agreed upon between different you know data integration vendors, different data management vendors, so that you can do the pipeline, the decentralized pipeline and routing across clouds, across vendors. And so I think that it will be, in my opinion, um, spearhead and, and led quite a bit by the um, uh, the, the service mesh community as they look to standardize service mesh. Excellent. All right. We'll pick one last question. One last comment. The last question from Jason is, does the mesh concept incorporate access privilege rules? Uh, so I touched on that a little bit. So I think the, you know, one of the, the lower layers of security is the, uh, the handshake that occurs for pipelines as those pipelines move across virtual clouds. And that, by the way, I mentioned that in my, Soapbox comment earlier is that the emergence of mature software defined networking really allows us to do things today that we could not do five years ago as far as, you know, automating the flow of data and events across BCNs. So that that's been, I think, a huge step forward that's enabled the mesh to be, you know, really practical um, in a modern uh, cloud architecture. From an, an access and, and privilege um, standpoint, I would look towards kind of the traditional you know, RBAC or role-based access controls that might, you know, come in line with, with LDAP, for example. So, mo you know, most of the, the data stores and the, the data pipeline technologies that would be participating in a mesh uh, should be capable of integrating with an LDAP. Or I would say that, it, I mean, at least in my area that I look after, I look at LDAP as kind of a, you know, table stakes for getting uh, people uh, uh, access controls uh, to the different infrastructure. Right. You see, thank, thank you for the expansion on the SMB. I'm now understanding the event-driven activity for the data integration. It's like having a balance of push and pull for services activity. All right, and, and I'll pick just one last comment from Christer. He's saying, thank you for sharing great information. Thank you so much, Christer. Wow, Jeff. I mean, we're 11 minutes past the hour. This is the first time I, I you know, overrun this. I mean, I'm always almost Sorry. punctual on this. I talk, I talk too much. <laughs> no, it's, it just means it's been been incredibly uh, amazing session. Thank you for sharing all this information and, and for being with us today um, in this podcast. Any, any final words from your end? 
No, it's just, it's uh, great to see you. I think this is exciting that you're doing the, the podcast. And, you know, I think we're still in the early days of this data mesh idea. So, you know, maybe um, once you're uh, truly globally famous with the podcast, we can do a, a second follow-up on, on data mesh and, and we'll see where we are. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much again, Jeff. Good luck with the election and speak to you soon as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's podcast. It's been a real pleasure to have Jeff and everybody joining and asking all these questions and comments. Um, just like every time, I would like to ask you all to do like this video, whether you're watching this on LinkedIn or YouTube. If you're watching on, on YouTube, please press the subscribe button so you stay posted with everything that I post. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, do connect with me or follow me on that. And final thing is to share this with your connection to help uh, spread the message and the education about the data mesh and, and future topics as well. Now, the next episode will be um, with the Dean of Big Data, the one and only Bill Schmarzo. And uh, during this podcast, we will discuss data economics. If you know Bill, I know you'll be joining that one live show. Now, if not, you better not mess it. Until then, be safe and see you soon.